What does it mean to know the love of God that restores? I've done some nasty things in my life. Can I really experience this love? Why should that matter to me? All this and more we'll be exploring on today's episode of Word Search with me, Christopher Dryden, where we're on episode 22, Remarkable Restorative Love. Welcome to Word Search, a place to search God's Word and a time for God's Word to search us. This is to encourage godly character development that stimulates us to prioritize seeking God's kingdom first and His righteousness, with the mind that it should inform and transform our prayer and practice. For here at Word Search, we look to find treasure in God's Word so that we can be hearers and doers of that Word for His glory. Coming up on Word Search, we'll be exploring where we've been in our series so far about God's kind of love before having our scripture base being read for us from Ephesians. Then we'll be looking at the remarkable nature of God's love before exploring further that restorative element that makes the difference when we consider God's love before concluding with some key points for us to take away and letting you know what you can expect next on Word Search. Previously on Word Search, we're exploring God's fit body plan where we consider the truth that every follower of Jesus is a member of the body of Christ. They have an essential role in expressing Christ to each other and the world. In considering an overview of the book of Ephesians, we focused on how God has given specific leadership gifts to equip and build the body so each member plays their part. Essential to that is the role of love, something that Paul encourages the saints to make the most of and make it their point of duty to embrace and to discover more about God's kind of love. Hence this series, exploring what kind of love that is. That's taken us to explore the perfect love of God as a whole and get glimpses of that kind of love from the beginning. Then we've seen what that love looks like in God's covenant relationship with his people Israel and in our last episode we saw how Jesus is the great expression of that love that reaches to rescue and serves to save. As we continue our exploration of God's kind of love, let's remind ourselves of the base scripture for our study taken from Ephesians chapter 3 verses 14 to 19 and Ephesians chapter 4 verses 15 to 16. Ephesians chapter 3 verses 14 to 19 says, I bow my knees before the Father, from whom every family in heaven and on earth is named, that according to the riches of his glory, he may grant you to be strengthened with power through his Spirit in your inner being, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, that you, being rooted and grounded in love, may have strength to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and length and height and depth and to know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. Ephesians 4 verses 15 to 16 tells us, Instead, we will speak the truth in love, growing in every way more and more like Christ, who is the head of his body, the church. He makes the whole body fit together perfectly. As each part does its own special work, it helps the other parts grow so that the whole body is healthy and growing and full of love. Father God in heaven, Thank you so much for giving us your Son and leaving your Spirit until the work on earth is done. And thank you for teaching us in your Word that this work is done when we understand your Word and live out your love that you have given us through your Son Jesus Christ. Help us then as we explore your Word to know more about your love and not just know it in our head or in our hearts, but know it throughout our lives 
so that it can impact us and others for your honour and your glory. Open our minds and open our eyes to see as we look forward to searching your word for your great name's sake. God's kind of love should already have us being amazed and in awe, but when we consider what God has done in Jesus Christ, it should really take our breath away. Don't just take my word for it though. Consider what Paul says in Romans chapter 5 verses 1 to 11. Therefore, since we have been justified through faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have gained access by faith into this grace in which we now stand, and we boast in the hope of the glory of God. Not only so, but we also glory in our sufferings, because we know that suffering produces perseverance, perseverance character, and character hope. And hope does not put us to shame, because God's love has been poured out into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. You see, at just the right time, when we were still powerless, Christ died for the ungodly. Very rarely will anyone die for a righteous person, though for a good person someone might possibly dare to die. But God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Since we have now been justified by his blood, how much more shall we be saved from God's wrath through him? For if while we were God's enemies we were reconciled to him through the death of his Son, how much more, having been reconciled, shall we be saved through his life? Not only is this so, but we also boast in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received reconciliation. I mean, consider what kind of love is that? What makes it so remarkable is to see what we would consider doing compared to what God has done in Christ. I mean, taking the extent of the love expressed, and that's what makes it so remarkable, considering the fact that we would scarcely die for a righteous person, let alone think about dying for a good one. And what God has done for us who are sinners, who are rebels, who are enemies. And then to note that this kind of love has been poured in our hearts through the Holy Spirit. And that makes it even more remarkable. And we're invited to reflect on that kind of love that seeks not just to reconcile, but to also give life. We are recipients of that love. And as such, we have a great reason to rejoice. And it's that kind of love then that gives us a perspective on how we approach issues of enduring suffering, going through tough times, knowing the goal that we're looking to reach because of this great love that has been poured into our hearts by the Holy Spirit. This is a fascinating love to consider and to take on board. This remarkable restorative love is something God expresses in Jesus and is something hinted at in how Jesus operated even before his sacrifice. Note a familiar episode in scripture found in Luke 15 verses 11 to 32. A certain man had two sons, and the younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the portion of goods that falls to me. So he divided to them his livelihood. And not many days after, the younger son gathered all together, journeyed to a far country, and there wasted his possessions with prodigal living. But when he had spent all, there arose a severe famine in that land, and he began to be in want. Then he went and joined himself to a citizen of that country, and he sent him into his fields to feed swine. And he would gladly have filled his stomach with the pods that the swine ate, and no one gave him anything. But when he came to himself, he said, How many of my father's hired servants have bread enough and to spare, and I perish with hunger? I will arise and go to my father, and will say to him, 
Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you, and I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired servants. And he arose and came to his father. But when he was still a great way off, his father saw him and had compassion and ran and fell on his neck and kissed him. And the son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and in your sight and am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, Bring out the best robe and put it on him, and put a ring on his hand and sandals on his feet, and bring the fatted calf here and kill it, and let us eat and be merry. For this my son was dead, and he's alive again. He was lost and is found. And they began to be merry. Now, his older son was in the field. And as he came and drew near to the house, he heard music and dancing. So he called one of the servants and asked what these things meant. And he said to him, Your brother has come, and because he has received him safe and sound, your father has killed the fatted calf. But he was angry and would not go in. Therefore, his father came out and pleaded with him. So he answered and said to his father, Lo, these many years I have been serving you. I never transgressed your commandment at any time. And yet you never gave me a young goat that I might make merry with my friends. But as soon as this son of yours came, who has devoured your livelihood with harlots, you killed the fatted calf for him. And he said to him, Son, you are always with me, and all that I have is yours. It was right that we should make merry and be glad, for your brother was dead and is alive again, and was lost and is found. Jesus is addressing criticism he's getting for eating with sinners. He's already given two stories that should connect with the listeners about finding something lost of great value and the role celebration should play in seeing something that was lost being found. This is a well-known and powerful parable and much has been said about it and written about it. For the purposes of this study, it's worth seeing how the love of the father looks out for the son who physically leaves to restore him. And it's also worth noting how the other son takes himself out of the place of celebration, but the love of the father even goes out to him in a bid to restore him to his right mind. The son who left home doesn't appreciate what it is to be a son, and it is the father who totally overlooks his begging for servanthood to restore him back to sonship. The son's decision to leave home was getting lost and being as good as dead, and the return home is something the father looks for to restore life and recover the one who is lost. This is another measure of the remarkable nature of God's love, which confounds and disgruntles the religious rulers of the day who don't even notice what their behavior says about their understanding of the Father's love. This attitude is reflected in the story in the other brother who doesn't understand the restorative love of his father. It's for the father to establish what right relations look like, Notice how the son talks about his dad's son, but the dad says it's his brother. That's also a consideration for how we appreciate the mission of Jesus to those who were in need of being restored to a right relationship with God and him reaching them was to do that. As that's outlined, we're challenged as to our own understanding of the remarkable restorative love of God. 
can we see how far it reaches and the extent to which it pleases the Father to see those who had essentially lived a totally bereft and spiritually bankrupt life by choice embraced by the Father on their return and the Father's heart to receive the repentant heart and restore them to the position he had always designed for his children. Key to this remarkable restorative love is the role of forgiveness. To restore implies something is not in its rightful place. And that's the case when someone disrupts and upsets a relationship. Forgiveness is crucial to restoration. For us to have a right relationship with God required the forgiveness of the Father. And having received that, we are to share that with others. This is such a crucial issue to Jesus that he remarks about the quality in his guide to prayer as seen in Matthew 6. And it's implicit in the quality of being merciful that he talks about as part of the Beatitudes in Matthew 5. It's something he also has to insist on when talking about right relations between God's people. In Matthew 18, he talks to his disciples about the process of what should happen if a brother sins and the efforts taken to endeavor to restore that person. Having stressed those steps and the heart of forgiveness and desire for restoration, we have this interesting encounter between him and Peter in verses 21 to 35 of Matthew 18. Then Peter came to Jesus and asked, Lord, how many times shall I forgive my brother or sister who sins against me? Up to seven times? Jesus answered, I tell you, not seven times, but seventy-seven times. Therefore, the kingdom of heaven is like a king who wanted to settle accounts with his servants. As he began the settlement, a man who owed him ten thousand bags of gold was brought to him. Since he was not able to pay, the master ordered that he and his wife and his children and all that he had be sold to repay the debt. At this, the servant fell on his knees before him. Be patient with me, he begged, and I will pay back everything. The servant's master took pity on him, canceled the debt, and let him go. But when that servant went out, he found one of his fellow servants who owed him a hundred silver coins. He grabbed him and began to choke him. Pay back what you owe me, he demanded. His fellow servant fell to his knees and begged him, Be patient with me, and I will pay it back. But he refused. Instead, he went off and had the man thrown into prison until he could pay the debt. When the other servants saw what had happened, they were outraged and went and told their master everything that had happened. Then the master called the servant in. You wicked servant, he said. I canceled all that debt of yours because you begged me to. Shouldn't you have had mercy on your fellow servant just as I had on you? In anger, his master handed him over to the jailers to be tortured until he should pay back all he owed. This is how my heavenly Father will treat each of you unless you forgive your brother or sister from your heart. Jesus takes the element of forgiveness and restoration serious enough to place it as a condition of living in the right rule of God. This is what the kingdom of heaven is like. This is a reflection of the rule of God. Look at how much we've been forgiven. Again, the one in charge overlooks the efforts to repay and in an act that we give the wonderful word magnanimous, a great act of mercy that's largely undeserved, the massive debt is cancelled. It's not given a manageable repayment plan. We're not given a brief holiday from repayments. The total cancellation of a significantly massive debt. Consider that. I mean, just think about that. As far as God is concerned, and as far as we should realize, when it comes to the debt we accrued from a life dedicated to sin, this could never be repaid by our own efforts. Especially seeing as though, no sooner do we think we've made a repayment, than we accrue even more debt through our attitudes and our actions. 
we say we'll never do that again and give it a few days a few hours a few minutes with the right nudge with the right provocation we're right back at it the debt is humongous yet the heart of the master indicating the love of the father is to wipe the debt away all of it everything every single penny every single sin the large and the small we come to him and receive his offered forgiveness and that should be a weight off our shoulders that should be a tremendous burden unloaded that should be liberating that should be reason for gratitude rejoicing and overwhelming relief it's also not unreasonable that we should be mindful of that in engaging with others the reality remains that however much we've been wronged by others and we appreciate that it can be very hurtful very damaging and in some cases extremely traumatic yet that is still not comparable to the weight of sin that we could never repay in our relationship with god our rebellion and refusal to acknowledge him for who he is and carrying on as though we are the center of the universe something that's so deeply rooted in our nature that we couldn't change it with all the willpower in the world that sets up such a massive gap in our relations with our creator that for him to look at that chasm to look at that gap and still bridge it to restore right relations that should affect how we deal with the hurt and pain of those who have wronged us remember the love with which we love each other is not our own love it's not our efforts that we muster to give it to others we receive this love we embrace it we grow in knowing it and it is this love the one we receive by the holy spirit that we exercise in likewise forgiving others this matters because that horizontal relationship that we have with one another affects the vertical one that we have with god elsewhere in luke's gospel account jesus will also remark to a religious ruler about how the extent to which you realize that you're forgiven is reflected in the amount you love and devote yourself to jesus that's something seen in the worshipful posture to jesus and it's something reflected in a restorative position with those who have wronged us in one shape or another we are to hear these stern warnings from jesus and once more reflect on the state of our own hearts and return to the love that restored us and trust God to be able to extend that love to others Jesus did not just talk the talk but he expressed it when he forgave those who mocked him beat him crucified him denied him and deserted him he expressed that forgiveness something we can be grateful for in scripture is that Jesus wasn't the only one but those who received his spirit also modeled this forgiveness we can see it for example in acts chapter 7 where stephen extended that forgiveness to those who were stoning him to death and there are other episodes in the new testament as well but there's one particularly intriguing incident that takes up an entire letter in scripture that's worth touching on we are privileged to have a personal correspondence between Paul and someone he clearly has a great deal of respect for, and it's worth listening to that correspondence in full. Paul, a prisoner for Christ Jesus, and Timothy, our brother, to Philemon, our beloved fellow worker, and Aphia, our sister, and Archippus, our fellow soldier, and the church in your house grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. I thank my God always when I remember you in my prayers because I hear of your love and of the faith that you have toward the Lord Jesus and for all the saints. And I pray that the sharing of your faith may become effective 
for the full knowledge of every good thing that is in us for the sake of Christ. For I have derived much joy and comfort from your love, my brother, because the hearts of the saints have been refreshed through you. Accordingly, though I am bold enough in Christ to command you to do what is required, yet for love's sake I prefer to appeal to you. I, Paul, an old man, and now a prisoner also for Christ Jesus, I appeal to you for my child Onesimus, whose father I became in my imprisonment. Formerly he was useless to you, but now he is indeed useful to you and to me. I am sending him back to you, sending my very heart. I would have been glad to keep him with me in order that he might serve me on your behalf during my imprisonment for the gospel. But I preferred to do nothing without your consent, in order that your goodness might not be by compulsion, but of your own accord. For this perhaps is why he was parted from you for a while, that you might have him back forever, no longer as a slave, but more than a slave, as a beloved brother, especially to me, but how much more to you, both in the flesh and in the Lord. So if you consider me your partner, receive him as you would receive me. If he has wronged you at all or owes you anything, charge that to my account. I, Paul, write this with my own hand. I will repay it, to say nothing of your owing me, even your own self. Yes, brother, I want some benefit from you in the Lord. Refresh my heart in Christ. Confident of your obedience, I write to you, knowing that you will do even more than I say. At the same time, prepare a guest room for me, for I am hoping that through your prayers I will be graciously given to you. Epaphras, my fellow prisoner in Christ Jesus, sends greetings to you, and so do Mark, Aristarchus, Demas, and Luke, my fellow workers. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit. So there are three people involved. Philemon, Onesimus, and Paul. But it's intriguing that the letter is addressed to the church. So Paul is connected to both men, and Paul knows there's a significant breach in the relationship, for Onesimus was Philemon's slave, and Paul is sending him back, which in itself is a remarkable act. Yet Paul goes on to defy the convention of the day by actively encouraging Philemon to restore Onesimus in the light of the right relationship that Onesimus has now cultivated with God for himself. Paul's letter to Philemon expresses that restorative love that is the norm for the church of the living God. Notice the approach and posture that Paul takes in the letter. He knows that he could lord it over Philemon. He could order him in his apostolic authority and exercise all those bells and whistles that make people think that they're the big cheese. But Paul's preference is to plead on behalf of Onesimus. Paul's posture is one of reaching to restore and reconcile, especially in the light of how precious and valuable both brothers are to him and to the ministry. The language of this letter, the tone, the desire for right relations to be restored, we are to read this and be challenged about how we deal with restoring relations that were broken but can be made right again. This love is the mark of the believers who follow Jesus. They are right with God through Jesus and they want other relationships to be made right because of the love of Jesus. And this love is not exclusive to those within the Christian community, it's this love that motivates Christian services to those in the world. That desire to serve for sure, but also that desire to see people not just have their physical, emotional and psychological needs met, but also to be restored to right relationship with the one who expresses such a remarkable love. On reflection and in conclusion, here are some points I want us to take away. 
First of all, it's remarkable that Christ would die for sinners. What God has done in Christ should amaze us, because we know what we're like, and indeed we know what we deserve. Reflecting on this should give us reason for rejoicing and gratitude for this remarkable love of God. Next, the love that dies for sinners is designed to restore them to right relationship with God. That is to say, the rescue plan isn't just to take you out of the mess, but it's to put you in the right place, restored to where you always belonged. Right relations with God then also enables us to have right relationships both with ourselves inside and then with others. Another point to consider, this kind of love is the reason we forgive. We have received it, so we share it. If we have truly experienced this love that restores, we've got to show it. And that is no better shown than in our capacity to forgive and look to restore. It's clear that this love is not just limited to Jesus when we see how his followers learned from it and lived it. We can see that in the apostles and people like Stephen who displayed that kind of love, and Paul gives us a great example of it through his work in reuniting Onesimus with Philemon. These episodes are there to instruct us on how we too can carry out and behave in a way that reflects this remarkable restorative love. What we see here is the ministry of reconciliation, and that is only possible by this remarkable love of God. The love from the beginning made all things right and all things well. That's what we see in Genesis chapter 1 and 2. And so the ministry of reconciliation that God calls us to be a part of sees us playing our role in enabling others to come back to that sense of wholeness and wellness with which God had created us from the beginning. Our challenge in the light of all of these concluding notes is, what can we do to commit ourselves to exploring this kind of love with others? Here are some prayer points I want us to consider in the light of what we've learnt today. First of all, let's praise God for a remarkable love that restores. Then let's go on to thank God for Jesus displaying this kind of love. Let's ask God for his spirit to help us express this kind of love to others. And let's seek God for chances to encourage others to likewise pursue this kind of love. Finally, let's celebrate God that the restoration will see us spend eternity in right standing with him. Next time on Word Search, we'll move on to episode 23 called Love Spread Among Us. We'll continue exploring how God's kind of love didn't just stay with Jesus, but was spread through his followers and how we too get involved in that spread. I hope you can join us for that. Please remember to like this video and share it with your friends and your loved ones. If you haven't done so already, please subscribe to the channel, turning that notification bell on so that you can get updates for upcoming episodes of Word Search. Feel free to leave your comments and questions in the comment section below. We read them and endeavour to respond where we can and we love to hear from you. This is a production of Zion Awake Ministries. Please consider supporting the ministry as that contribution helps to develop our service to others for the glory of God. You can find the details on how to do that as well as get to know more about Zam in the details in the description below. My name is Christopher Dryden. Thank you so much for taking the time to watch and listen to this episode. I hope it's been a blessing to you in your journey with Jesus. 
For here at Word Search, we find treasure in God's Word so that we can be hearers and doers of that Word for His glory. Until next time on Word Search, God richly bless you as you live out His remarkable restorative love for His namesake. Shalom.